Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. I can see that I'm going to have to raise the intellectual tenor of my pitch tonight, so let me <laughs> pull out some big words here. Um, and I realized once I was actually pitching and this thing went off, and I thought at the time, and I mentioned it to the group, that uh, that this is this is a miracle. I, I think of all the rainy nights that I stood in front of phone booths in Hollywood, waiting for my dealer to call, <laughs> only to be told the shit wouldn't be here till tomorrow. <laughs> Life would have been so much easier with cell phones then. <clears throat> uh, before I forget, I want to thank Bob for asking me to come here uh, tonight. He and I have been talking via email and over the phone for several months, and I guess because of uh, what I do for a living, it's always very difficult for me to commit in um, in a long-term advance to speak somewhere because being an actor is sort of like uh, being in the Army. You're not quite ever sure when you're going to be called up to do something. So, But I'm glad I was free, and I'm glad, I, I'm glad I'm here. And I also want to say how... Thank you. And also it seems uh, a perfect venue for a convention... What better place for an alcoholic to be where there's gambling, free booze, and prostitutes? Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you've got to walk through the whole goddamn casino to get in here. Yeah? <laughs> this convention has cost me $10,000 so far. You know, I guess it goes without saying, obviously, that everything I say from this podium is my own opinion, but being the egotistical alcoholic that I am, obviously, I think it is the right opinion. <laughs> um, I am of a firm belief that anyone with any belief system, with any non-belief system, can get sober if they are willing to show up, go to meetings, and not drink. To me, that's the only requirement. All the other stuff becomes part of, in my case, sort of a revisiting of one's childhood memories, fantasies, hurts, joys, expectations, fantasies particularly. So to let you know that I should be here, let me just tell you a small biography of myself. I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Didn't leave there until I was 21 years old. Um, I didn't know about Las Vegas or, or places like this then, and I used to say that New Orleans is the only town in the world that the signs on the bar say happy hour any waking moment. I was an only child, or still am, I guess. <laughs> Unless there's a way to give birth and death, I don't think I'm going to have any brothers or sisters. Um, and from, from my earliest memories, I always thought that there was something better to be than I. I was a gregarious child, I suppose, very Catholic. I was uh, drafted into the Army of Christ at the ripe age of two weeks, like most cradle Catholics are. <laughs> I did not volunteer, <laughs> and when given the opportunity to re-up, I didn't. <laughs> I was taught by nuns and priests most of my life. As a matter of fact, I was thinking earlier that um, in, in, in regard to this being a good place to have a convention, I thought that it was you know, sort of akin to sending a priest to an altar boy slumber party, but... <laughs> I made my reservations long ago. <laughs> now, you see, I thought about not saying that. Now, you know, I should trust my first impressions as an actor. 
timing is everything. Anyway, I grew up very Catholic, very afraid, very afraid. I mean, that, I mean, uh, this, this overriding fear. My father also, like a good alcoholic that he was, left when I was two years old. I never knew him. Um, I met him once when I was, uh, I think, seven years old. He came. From, I, don't, I don't even know why, because you know, in New Orleans in the fifties, when couples uh, separated or divorced, it wasn't like today that you feel good and you go to preschool with the kids and you have quality time with both parents. He was dead to us. He lived two miles from my house. Never saw him. But for some reason, when I was seven years old, he came and got me. Took me to the racetrack. <laughs> Left me in the car while he went to gamble. And that was the last time I saw him. I had the same name as he. Consequently, I was never called John growing up. I was always called by my first two initials. I hated him. Didn't know him, but I hated him. But as I grew older, I thought more of him, obviously, as a child, I suppose, would. And to fast forward, just because of the synchronicity of this, when I moved to Hollywood and started to pursue a career as an actor, and I got into a series in the late 70s, and was making a fairly good amount of money, considering the time and the, uh, and the job. And I thought it was time to go see him, time to visit him and to figure out who this man was, because I'd known that he had gotten married shortly after leaving me and my mother, and had three more children, who I never knew. M named the first one John LaRoquette as well. <laughs> sort of a white George Foreman, I guess, my father was. <laughs> so I decided to go to New Orleans and meet him, and the day I made the reservations for the plane, he died. He was 53 years old, younger than I am now when he died. Years later, I heard from his uh, wife, his, his widow, that at 53 years old, he looked 90, cirrhosis of the liver, etc., etc., and that on his deathbed, the last words out of his mouth was my name, my initial, so they knew that he was talking about me. And I felt sorry for him because I realized that all of his life, he suffered from the shame and guilt that most alcoholics suffer from who don't get sober. I repeated his actions, strangely enough. In 1977, I had a son, my first son. And I consider that actually the sort of launch pad of my serious alcoholism. Prior to that, I didn't drink very much. Um, I am a child of the 60s, and drugs was my first choice. I lived in the French Quarter of New Orleans and was into all the things of the day that were popular, be it uh, marijuana, acid, psilocybin, whatever it was. We didn't drink very much in New Orleans. We saw tourists throwing up all the time. It didn't look like a lot of fun. <laughs> I was known as the druggist. People would send me stuff and say, take it and tell us what it does. <laughs> but anyway, enough of childhood reverie. Um, so when my son was born, and I was actually fired from this uh, television series because I was uh, in a group of men in the series, and we were misfits, kind of black sheep, sort of. That's actually what it was called. But... Um, and we sort of lived our roles off camera as well as on, because I figured that's what an actor did. You know, you were Errol Flynn, Cary Grant. You got drunk and caroused and had fist fights in bars and had food fights in restaurants and basically made a complete ass of yourself whenever possible, because it was part of the image. Well, I was fired from that show. Um, the gentleman who was the star of it, actually, though, did a kind turn and waited until I was, my contract was picked up for the next season, then fired me. So the, the Universal Studios had to pay me which was nice of him, considering he was the one that fired me. <clears throat> and his reason once he gave to my wife was that whenever he's in public, he's vulnerable. And I was vulnerable because I was an arrogant, I am an arrogant, um, boisterous, scared man. And I certainly was a boisterous, scared youth. So my drinking got to the point where my wife looked at me one day and said, I realize that you want to die. Would you please just not do it in front of the children? And I left. My son was two years old. And there was a daughter involved, too, because my wife's husband, her deceased husband, she had a child when I met her. And when we married, I inherited that girl as well, who is my daughter to this day. So I left. And I lived um, on a sailboat, Marina del Rey, basically lying down, snorting heroin, and urinating in an orange juice bottle for several months. No work. 
And I thought at one point, I said, this must have been what my father did. And I didn't want to be my father. Um, he might have been a very nice guy. And from everything I hear about him, he was a nice guy. But he was an alcoholic like me. So, as most alcoholics' lives are, there are, there are, there are pinnacles and, and, and depths and roller coasters, and sometimes you're on a plateau that seems fine. And shortly after, about a year after that, I got a job that allowed me to move off the sailboat, get my family back from England. Actually, my wife had gone back to her home in England with our children. And she came back, and we got into an apartment somewhere in what I now call Burrito Canyon. I think it's actually North Hollywood, but... <laughs> but I was still drinking, and I, and I, I still was acting. You know, I, I, I never... I just continued acting. I was, I was just fortunate that way in that, in that I just kept once in a while getting a gig. Well, from the years of 1977 until 1982 were my real season in hell. Um, it got worse and worse and worse. Of course, it, it has to. But jobs kept coming, and therefore I thought I was fine. But always there was this feeling that I wasn't good enough. You know, that sounds cliche. But to give you an example of that, when I was a kid in the French Court of New Orleans in the 60s, I made up a personality. Uh, became another person. His name was Preston Macbeth. <laughs> and because the whole, entire Anglophile invasion of rock and roll music in America was during that time, obviously I had to be an Englishman because that was the cool thing to be. And so I, I became this person. I lived in a little apartment in the, uh, in the French Quarter close to the Jack's Brewery, which was very convenient. Um, and I had entire relationships with people, lovers, friends, as that person. Never dropped it for an instant. And this went on for nearly a year. I sometimes would love to find some of those people today. <laughs> and wonder if they ever sat in front of their television and went, that fucker looks like... As alcoholics, we certainly burn a wide swath for our lives a lot of the time. So, you know, the childhood thing I, I enjoy talking about only because it just shows the absolute insanity of my thinking. The insanity of the complete unwillingness or inability to accept any responsibility for anything that I did. If there was any way of getting away with something, I would take it, regardless of how extreme, regardless of how insane. One small example, the best one. When I was in fourth grade, I lost a religion book. I knew I couldn't go back to class because Sister Mary Rhino, whoever it was, <laughs> would beat the crap out of me. And so I was on the playground, and I turned to some of my friends, and I said, I have to run over to the convent for a music lesson. I was a musician at the time. I was a musician for a long time. So I left the playground and walked to the convent, walked beyond the convent, and kept walking. And kept walking. Our school was sort of in the center of New Orleans, in the old, old section of New Orleans, the ninth, the ninth Ward, it's called. The, God bless you. The, um, the real white trash section of New Orleans, the Irish, Creole, Italian mix. And I kept walking, and I kept walking. I finally reached the river downtown New Orleans. I was gone all day. I was 10 years old. I was gone all day, playing on the levee, not really thinking about the consequences of what I did. And as, as the day went on, I got hungry, and I was getting late, and I realized I've got to go back. I, can't, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't think I can get a job and live on my own at, <laughs> at 10. So what do I do? You know, do, I, do I go and fess up that I was scared? You know, I'd be, be a little bit of a man. I was scared. I lost a book. I was afraid of the repercussions, and so I ran. No. So I, I started heading back to school, and on the way, I, I cut my hands punched a wall or hit the pavement with my knuckles or something. I wasn't sure what I did. And cut my shirt, tore my shirt, my little St. Mary the Angels with a big, one of those big bleeding hearts with swords in it and stuff. You know. <laughs> and about a block away from school, took on this decrepit sort of, you know, Oliver Twist persona and started limping back to the school. Well, as I get about a half a block away, these, you know, these, these marionette nuns, black and huge white whipples, come floating out of the school at me like, <laughs> like condors, you know. <laughs> and they scoop me up, and they say, where have you been? 
I was kidnapped. I was walking and this man in a big black trench coat grabbed me and threw me in a truck. Oh, and poor baby, poor baby, poor baby. Mother called, coming, oh my God, oh my God, my baby, my baby. Brought me home, fixed my knuckles, put me in bed. <laughs> About 6.30, the door knocked and the police were there. They're little, they're little books. Now tell me something exactly what happened. Well, do I fess up now? A little late. I've got my Ovaltine here next to the bed. Uh, I'm, I'm getting SpaghettiOs for dinner, a real treat in those days. And so I tell them the story of what happened, of how this man grabbed me, took me in the van, Drove me to the river, said he had to go somewhere and left me locked in the van. And I broke out of the van, miraculously, hence the wounds. <laughs> so I broke the back window of the van. This is going really good, I think. <laughs> Police are dutifully writing down their descriptions. And they leave. Whew. Finish my SpaghettiOs. Watch Superman or whatever was on TV at the time. And I thought I was fine until they called and said they had caught him. <laughs> now we have a dilemma. Fess up to a petty crime like losing my book letting a man go to the electric chair. <laughs> it was a toss-up. <laughs> but, thank God, or whatever, that something in me said, you know, no, hold on a second. <laughs> you know, it's bad enough that you're going to burn in hell to go down there and have this guy waiting for you. And so I fessed up, and I was beaten severely, by, not only by my grandfather. I mean, he would call people and say, you want to come over and beat the shit out of Jay? <laughs> when I got to school, the nuns beat the crap out of me, then sent me over to Father Dominic, and he beat the crap out of me with, it, with that, that rope, you know, with the three knots in it. That is sort of the, 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 symphon the symphonic resonance of how I lived my life. Some incidents were much smaller. You couldn't get much bigger than that. But whatever the situation was, whatever I did something that I was ashamed of or thought that you wouldn't want me to do, I would find a way to finagle my way out of it by reflecting responsibility to the universe, to the guy next door, anywhere. My first sponsor, who was this very rotund Jewish atheist, told me that <laughs> there are two emotions in life that we suffer from as alcoholics. One is shame, and one is guilt. And that primarily Jews have guilt. And little Catholic boys like me have shame. And the difference being is that when you have guilt and you do something that you know is wrong, you feel bad. And shame is that when you do something wrong and you get caught, you feel bad. <laughs> if I could get away with it, I didn't feel bad. And so, 1980 comes along. <clears throat> and I got a big job movie called Stripes, and we go away to location to film this movie. While on location, John Lennon is killed, December 8, 1980. Me and, God rest his soul, John Candy, and some other fellows in the movie, Bill Murray, etc., we had an Irish wake for about two weeks. We were loaded 24-7. 
and the grief that we had. And it was true grief that we had. Um, we dedicated my bathtub to be the cooler in my room, and we were actually in a town that didn't sell alcohol. Frankly enough, we were filming at the Jim Beam Distillery, but they didn't serve alcohol in the town. And so there were two uh, PAs, gophers, on the set that their only job was to make sure they passed each other going the 12 miles to the liquor store. <laughs> and we stayed drunk and stayed drunk and stayed drunk. And during that film, I had an accident while filming a scene, almost cut my nose off, uh, smashed into a door, and my face went through a window. And I was um, really lo terrible, terrible looking, really bad. And I still carry that, that scar to this day. Um, in a parenthetical, the only time I've ever been censored on television was once doing the Johnny Carson show, and I was telling this story. And I took one of Johnny's pencils out of his cup, and I said, you know, the, the interesting thing about it was for about a month after that, I could do coke like this. <laughs> and when I, I got home that night and watched it, it went, you know, for about a month. It went backwards. But. So Stripe ends, Stripe ends, and, and I was just, my, I, I, you know, I described myself as like looking like I was smuggling doorknobs under my face. I mean, you know, I, I tend toward fleshy anyway, you know, this large, poured Indian Creole face that I have. But I looked, I looked horrible. I looked horrible. And May of that year, May of 1981, I ran away. Now, I was the kind of drunk that preferred drinking alone. I, my favorite place was to get in whatever piece of crap car I could afford at the time and drive to the Santa Monica Pier by the beach and sit under the pier with a book and a bottle. And I would read and drink until I couldn't see the page anymore and then pass out in my car and sleep most of the night. Sleep the night away. But I also had a tendency to disappear. I would go away. I'd run away, like my old man did. And I was a great blackout drinker. I mean, a really classic but blackout drinker. Didn't, there, were, there were days. I actually came, came to on a plane once, having no idea where I was going. <laughs> Very embarrassing, trying to figure out where the destination is without actually asking. <laughs> Looking at the guy next to you and saying, so what's the weather like there? <laughs> Listening to the, to, the, to the accents of the stewardesses. And the two times that I did that, I would always be going to the same place, home, to New Orleans. Because I had places I could hide, and I could drink 24-7. So anyway, I disappeared this one time, and I came back to L.A., and in order to cover my tracks, being the smart alcoholic that I am, I don't know why I did this, but I checked into a hospital in Century City, into the alcoholic ward. I don't know why I did that. I really don't, because, you know, alcohol to me was, you know, Dylan Thomas is quoted as saying, when asked what he wanted to be when he grow, grew up, he said, I want to be the drunkest man in the world. And that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be the drunkest man in the world, or the stonedest man in the world, I mean, whatever was around. But, but as I look back on it, I can truly say that alcohol is my drug of preference. So I check into this hospital, and I call my wife. And I say, honey, guess where I've been for the last week and a half? <laughs> In a hospital. Because I know I must have a problem. So I check into this hospital, and they put me in a room, and on the side of the bed is this blue book. And I'm an absolutely avaricious and voracious reader. I've read all of my life. What little, what, I was a horrible student, but whatever education or intelligence or wisdom that I might possess comes from reading. And I've read incessantly all my life. Anyway, so I sat that day and read this book. And at the end of it, a light bulb went off into my head. And I said, holy crap, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> but the next thought was, well, I'm glad we settled that. Now I can drink in peace. And, and my wife, who is a remarkable woman, um, remarkable woman, I mean, to put up with me, you know, it's just, we've been married almost 30 years, and, and for most of that, you know, I've been sober over 20 years, almost 21 years. 
uh, except for seven or eight years of it, uh, we've had a very good life together. Um, and I don't think I've ever said this to her face, and I hope she never listens to this tape, but I, 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 I talk about her as the absolute perfect Al-Anon codependent. And the definition being that if she were in a plane and it was, it was crashing and hitting the ground, right before it hit the ground, someone else's life would flash before her eyes. <laughs> but she's gotten much better. And she has called me on my shit for almost 30 years, and... And, you know, whenever I've won one of those little statue things for acting, it is always with great humility that I say that without her I would be dead, and I would be. Certainly I got sober for myself. Had to. No other reason in the world will work as far as I'm concerned. But it was good to have her there when I did. Anyway. So I read this book, and then I said, you know, I'm fine now. I'm going to leave. Didn't say the whole program. Didn't do whatever it was in those days. Then, it had, they, you know, Betty Ford was still trying to decide what she wanted to drink when I got sober. <laughs> So there wasn't like, you know, Sierra Tucson or, you know, come, come pitter-patter against the flowers and talk about your inner child bullshit when I got sober. So you went to meetings, you got a cigarette and a cup of coffee, you sat down, and you, that's it. So, But I left the hospital, and that was it. No intention of ever say, uh, 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 drinking again. That lasted about a, 36 hours. I would stay sober for maybe a day or so, but I never went to meetings. I never, never considered it. I never considered it. And then shortly toward the end of that year, actually in the beginning of February of the next year, 1982, I had a job as a guest star on a television series, a Tom Hanks old series years ago. And in the middle of the week, I was fired from the job, not because of my behavior, because the network saw me after they had cast me and said we wanted, you know, short and Jewish, not, not tall and Creole. So, pardon me? Is it my car? Is it on fire or something? What? <laughs> is, is he pitching tonight? What? <laughs> Somebody just come to and thought that's who I was? We shall never be organized. <laughs> so I was fired from this job, and I had money for not having to work, which is always the best thing as an actor. And so I bought a bunch of cocaine and a bunch of Johnny Walker Black and went to a friend's house who I used to get stoned with a lot. And we sat down at his table like every night, like all nights. And we started doing the coke and started drinking scotch and was having a good old time. And somewhere during the evening... I'll preface this first by saying, and I'll talk about it a little bit, I'm not a real big believer in God, okay? You know, being Catholic, I have very heavy atheistic tendencies. <laughs> the closest I could say is that, by definition, I am an agnostic, a true agnostic, that I do not believe that his existence can be proved or not proved, his existence. So I sort of have my own thing, but I'll talk about that a little for those people that might be new and have the same problem I did when I came in. But... Whatever happened, all of a sudden I was standing on the other side of the room, looking at me, sitting at the table, this rather large, ugly, angry man, talking about the lousy business and how it was going to be different when he ran it. And a thought entered this mind standing against the wall, just three words, what a loser. And then the, the incident was over. The Jonathan Edwards incident was over. And I was back at the table, you know, just jabbering along. And I stopped, looked at my friend Tom, and said calmly, I'll be right back, I'm going to go to the head. And I got up and walked out of his house, got in my car, went home, and never drank again. Now, I don't know what happened that night. You know, certainly the, uh, the, the hand of providence... Uh, I don't really trust, nor do I truly believe that I was special somehow and, and picked from all of the dying alcoholics in the world that night to be saved. 
If there is a God, I'd much rather he saved Eric Clapton's son as he fell from the hotel window. But I went home, and I remembered one name of a guy that I had come across while I was in that hospital, a fellow named Edward, who was uh, now deceased, a uh, great old alcoholic. I called him and said, what do you do now? I don't want to drink anymore. What do you do now? And he brought me to a place called Yucca in Hollywood, famous meetings. And that was it. I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, instantaneously. I never again once had the desire to drink or to get stoned. I was truly struck sober that night, February 6th, 1982. And again, <laughs> I was on a Today Show one day, and, um, and Brian Gumbel congratulated me for being sober. And, and I said to him, you know, congratulating a drunk for not drinking is like giving a cowboy with hemorrhoids a trophy for not riding his horse. <laughs> And so here I was, 30, 33 years old, 30, 34 years old. No, 33 years old. Um, and sober. I started going to meetings religiously, became a zealot. Uh, immediately looked for a sponsor and found that, that Jewish atheist I was talking about because I heard him share one night and his belief system about the, the whole God thing sort of paralleled mine. And... Um, Luckily for me, not, you know, I think I'd have stayed sober regardless, because I, you know, the whole God thing is, is a semantic argument with me most of the time. But luckily, the second step doesn't mention God. So just on the semantics of the, the background that I came from, it was so much easier for me to consider the word higher power than God. It just was simpler. I don't pray. I meditate a great deal. But at the same time, I'm a member of a Catholic church in my town. I'm a lector there. And maybe I'm more like Woody Allen. Someone asked Woody Allen once if he was an atheist, and he said, no, most people think I'm an atheist, but God knows I'm just the loyal opposition. Because, <laughs> you know, I... I, I'm gonna, I all right. This is such a funny joke, I've got to tell you. Especially where, considering where we are. This is how I think God feels about my sobriety. A man is in debt. He's got $5,000, but he owes the bookies $10,000, and they're going to break his legs if he doesn't pay up. So he goes into a church and falls to his knees in front of the altar and says, God, please help me. I've got $5,000 here. If I don't get $10,000, they're, they're going to kill me. They're going to hurt me. And he's sitting there in sweat and tears. And as he is meditating, all of a sudden, the church becomes very quiet, and this voice that seems like it's coming from everywhere says, Go to Vegas. <laughs> Excuse me? Go to Vegas. So the guy's got a little extra change. He gets on a bus. He goes to Vegas. Steps out of the bus in the Greyhound bus station in Vegas. Then this voice again says, Go to Caesars. <laughs> Where? Caesars. The guy walks, walks in on the Caesars Casino, and has no idea what to do, and says, what now? And the voice says, go to the blackjack table. So he does. He sits down, and the voice says, bet it all. <laughs> so he puts the $5,000 down on the table. The dealer deals a hand, looks at his cards. He has 12. And the voice says, take a hit. <laughs> so he does. And he gets a four. Now he's got 16. The voice says, take another hit. It's very scared. But he says, give me another hit. Gets a two. Now he has 18. The dealer has 19. The voice says, take another hit. 
takes another hit, he gets an ace. Got 19, but it's a push. He says, okay, at least I'm a push. I can go take another hit. <laughs> but I, I've got 19, it's a push. I take another hit. <laughs> takes another hit. It's a two. He has 21. And the voice says, I don't fucking believe it. <laughs> That's how I think God feels about my sobriety. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I do very few things in my life with any, any real perfection. Probably nothing with real perfection. I have stayed sober perfectly. I have not gotten drunk in over 20 years. I have not gotten stoned. I have done shameful things in sobriety. I've hurt people, manipulated them, lied to them. Made amends where I could. I, as I said, I was a real zealot when I first got sober because I felt so good. I mean, so wonderful. And the idea, and I, and I guess I was lucky in that I didn't have that white knuckle thing going at all. I mean, I was... Sober. I was uh, rocketed in the fourth dimension thing. You know, I mean, I was, wow, where's the next meeting? I used to drink at this place called the Rain Check Room in Hollywood, which was the real only actor's bar, New York kind of actor's bar in L.A. Dalton Trumbo's Oscar was on the back bar, which meant that his son could drink there for free as long as he left the Oscar there. And every out-of-work actor and semi-working actor would go there. And when I got sober, I would go back there with the big book, and I swear to you, I would sit next to the guys at the bar and look at them. And in some ways, it was unfortunate that I had to give up a lot of relationships when I got sober. Not because I didn't want to. And you've all experienced this. They didn't want to be around me. You know, some guys that I used to have a lot of fun with, or at least thought I did. I don't know. Bullshit. I had a lot of fun getting loaded. Let's not mistake that, all right? When I was a young man, it was spectacular. It gave me everything I was missing in my life. It gave me a, a paintbrush. That, that illuminated the world for me. And I'm glad that I did it. I'm so glad that I did it because besides the pleasure and sensation, which, you know, I'm an alcoholic, I love sensation. But it brought me to a place where I had to face me finally because I finally got sick of me. So I got sober and got a, a couple of little jobs in 82. And toward the end of 82, I was offered a job where I had to go on location. And it wasn't, I wasn't scared to go on location. I really, trust me when I say, alcohol did not, I mean, it just, it left my existence. You know, Carl Jung talked about that when he talked about that, that fundamental shift in perception that happens in alcoholics who stay sober. Where that night that I could, from one moment to the next, not conceive of living without a drink to the next moment, not conceive of living with a drink. It just ended for me. And it was, but it was a crappy job. Low budget comedy. Uh, not that I'm above that sort of thing, but. <laughs> but I looked at Elizabeth and I said, hey, we can pay for Christmas with this job. You know, we haven't had a real Christmas in a while. You know, it's sort of like the tree and waiting for God knows our Christmas tree. You know, like two broken branches and a thing on it. You know, not much. And so I took this job. And I went to Buellton, California. If you guys are familiar with it, it's up the coast of Santa Barbara. Claim the fame is that it sells a lot of pea soup, I guess, there. <laughs> and I was in this hotel doing this movie, um, and it was a camp movie, so we had to go out to Zaka Lake, about 20 miles from the hotel, to film, etc. And when you're on location, you come back, and everybody, grip, actors, gaff, everybody, <laughs> to the hotel bar, immediately. And I didn't want to do that. I just didn't want to do that. And so I went back to my room, and I had the big book with me. 
and I was sitting on the bed reading, and this feeling came to me. And it was a unique feeling for me, and one that I consider profound now, that I realized sitting on the bed alone with just myself was okay. No, I would have drank with Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. It would not have mattered to me. But I felt so comfortable being alone. And that meant something. It really, really meant something to me. You know, I think you think as an actor, you know, well, actors usually are, are you know, I mean, not, not, I don't know. At least this one. Not a whole lot of self-esteem. I mean, the fact that I can pretend to be somebody in real life and convince you of it. Jesus. I mean, make me two-dimensional in front of a camera. I can convince you of anything. And also, I realize that they actually there's a place where you can go and lie and they pay you. <laughs> and so after that job, it, life just became a daily process. Surrounded by this community that I had found. As I've often said it, all my life I was looking for the other lepers. Because I knew they were somewhere. And when I walked into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous, I went, aha. The other untouchables, like me. And I felt so good here. I mean, from the moment I walked in the rooms, I felt good. And chance that had something to do with the sort of subterranean Catholic Christian religious person that I fight being because as a child the, the only good memories I had was when there was a group of us together doing something within a sort of communal fellowship way. Most of the time it was horrendous Third Reich kind of existence with these uh, demented, uh, psychologically um, cruel uh, messengers of Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me started. <laughs> I think I'll be writing a little bit tonight in my room. <laughs> yeah, and the, the strange thing is, you know, also... Uh, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> One of my best friends now is a priest. I mean, the pastor of our church. He's a diocesan priest, though, which meant he was sort of more like a, you know, a plumber priest. Not, he wasn't a Jesuit, you know, the Nazis for Jesus, and he wasn't... You know, uh, a Franciscan, um, he wasn't part of an order. He was just a working man, as a young man, decided he wanted to be a priest. And he's an he's a, he's a, a altruistic, beautiful, giving individual. And I know, you know, and that's fine with me. And I love that, you know. It's just, and as we've seen with all the crap that's come out about the few true sickos that have hidden behind the cock throughout ages, um, you know, it really is a case that you shouldn't kill the me you shouldn't kill the message because of the messengers. But I just have a thing about it, and I always will. Um, if you're if you're and I noticed by the by the <coughs> countdown, there are some people here. There's a lot of sobriety here, so in a convention, it's not as as applicable. But you know, I I think that if you show up to meetings as much as you possibly can and do nothing else in your life, eventually you will become able to have a relationship with yourself that you trust. I actually started trusting my instinct as a person. You know, I was always comfortable on a stage. I've always been comfortable in front of you being somebody else. No problems at all. And, I have, and I'm brilliant at it, not to blow my own horn, but I do that well. It's the one thing in the world I do well. You know, give it to me. Um, <laughs> I, know, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. You know, I'm not a real actor anyway, though. You know, as, as, to paraphrase Peter O'Toole in my favorite year, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm not an actor, I'm a TV star. Is my favorite quote. That's going to be a, you know, and that's basically the truth. Robert De Niro is an actor. He's a surgeon. I'm sort of like a, a veterinarian, you know. <laughs> but I think the key is for me and was to get active with you because the more I had you in my life, the less I wanted to be away from you. You know, and my son, Jonathan, who is 25 years old and has been sober eight years.
He and I used to have fist fights. And him screaming, I'm not like you! And I would say, no, you smoke a lot more dope than I did. <clears throat> but he got sober. You know, and, 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 and the way he got sober was he got caught by the police driving down the highway and the guy opened the window and it was like a Cheech and Chong movie inside the car. And he was turned over to the court system at 16 years old, which was the best thing in the world that happened to him. You know, I introduced him to a guy named Bob T. in Los Angeles, who is a remarkable fellow. Uh, you know, the, 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 the jailhouse cat. You know, he said he got sober when he realized he was having a shootout with cops in a 7-Eleven. And went, you know what, my timing sucks. Cause... And he's been sober for years and has gotten a lot of very famous people sober. And I gave him to Jonathan. I gave Jonathan to him. But that's neither here nor there. Jonathan, when he was a little boy... I would take, I got sober when he was four years old. And I would take him to find drunks. So that would be babysitting him or something because my wife, thank God, worked at the time. And there were two drunks that I was trying to help that lived, in, there's an area of LA called Barnstall Park, which is where the Hollyhock House is, a, a house that Frank Lloyd Wright built. And it's on a hill at Vermont and Hollywood. And it used to be a very posh neighborhood, I guess, in the 20s. But on the other side of Barnstall Park, on this hillside, there's, there's a whole hobo town. And this fellow Tom, whenever he would go off the wagon, that's where he would go. He would leave his mother's house where he lived and go live in Barnesville Park. And so Jonathan's six years old, and I'm trudging him up these hills to go find these drunks. And he's, you know, I put Tom in the car to take him home to give him a shower, to try to take him to the hospital. And he would stay sober for a week or two, and then eventually one day was hit by a train and died, was killed. Um... But Jonathan was exposed to it early, and I think the seed was set, which is which is was remarkable. And I told him that if I were if I had gotten sober when I was sixteen, I could have really made something of myself. And he is a remarkable individual to have gotten it that young. And I can see in his eyes. You know, we've all been around newcomers enough to look in their eyes, and when they're you know they're like like Frank Langella's eyes, the actor, they just keep flicking back and forth. <laughs> but you know they don't have it. They say they have it. A friend of mine said said something very good. Uh, a young actor who unfortunately died, uh, Chris F. We'll call him. Who, uh, was, who tried to get sober a long time. And, and I would go to meetings with him. He would call me when he was on the road doing a movie. And a friend of mine, after he died, said, he was so busy saying yes to us, he didn't hear a word we said. You know, and he was that sort of petitionative fellow who had to please you, but just wasn't getting any of it. And so if, if, when you first come in here, you know, the first thing that you have to do is fire your mind, is what my sponsor told me. You know, because my best thinking almost killed me. I mean, that's, that's a cliche, but it's absolutely true. My best thinking almost killed me. Um, and it's important just to be here, even if you don't believe it. You know, and I truly believe that Alcoholics Anonymous meetings are a bit like lifting weights. I don't have to believe it's going to work. If I continue to lift the weights, I'm going to get muscles. I'm gonna, something's going to change. And I spent a lot of time in meetings. When I was, and, I, and I did all this bullshit you're supposed to do, you know, which I don't necessarily think is right or wrong. I don't, you know, if you're part of the community, then you should help keep the community fresh and clean, and I, I washed dishes and did coffee and picked up, you know, I had a, at the time a Cadillac, and it was a drunk mobile, and, you know, there'd be, there'd be puke in the back seat, and, you know, horrible, paranoid speed freaks sitting back, I mean, it was, I felt like Jack Nicholson, you know, in, in uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, when he took them all fishing, you know, just, Like some sort of schizoid clown car, this thing was. You know? But a lot of those guys stayed sober. But to get active, to, you know, and you can't, I don't know if you can do it wrong as long as you stay sober and come here, because I didn't do it right. I mean, it took me two years to write a fourth step. It's, you know, it's all of the, the, the logistics of my sobriety. There's no book perfect way of doing it. There's no timetable to do it as long as I show up and I don't drink. And that's all I really have to do, and whatever else is going to happen will present itself to me. And only by staying here, yeah, it's really dangerous when you be behind podiums because the priest comes out and you swear to God. Jesus. <laughs> um, <laughs> just stay here. A year and a half after I was sober, I got a job, a little comedy pilot. Wasn't going to be anything. Who knows? It was a job. It was a great job. $12,000, $15,000 for the job. We could pay the rent for eight months and nine months and really live nicely. That turned into a series that lasted almost ten years. 
Nothing of that would have happened had I not been sober. I'd be playing handball with John Belushi. I have no doubt about it. John Belushi died a month after I got sober. And I watched John, and I watched John's friends. And it's just, listen to me. Get it, will you? I said that to so many men over the past 20 years, and so many of them don't. And I wish to Christ there was a way to pry open your head, put that seed of whatever it is, the rationalization of reality about who we are and what we must do to stay here, and most of us don't get it. And I hate that. I really hate that, that most of us are going to die drunk. I guess that's the facts, right? I mean, if you look at the stats, most of us in this room will die drunk. Maybe not this room. Okay. No, we're special. <laughs> we're in a casino, and we're not fucking or gambling or drinking. <laughs> well, there may be some couples here. I don't know about the first part, but I know about the second two. All right, now I'm going to tell you a story, and then I'm going to finish because, um, uh, you know, I don't want your asses getting numb. But this is a story about why, and it was a, a real wake-up call to me, and the lesson was don't ever, please ever, become a star or a guru or a mensch in AA. Not mensch, what's the Jewish word for genius? Maven, sorry. Mensch, become a mensch. Mensch is okay. <laughs> you know, and I, because of what I do for a living, am not anonymous in most of the meetings I go to. I can't just be a drunk in the back of the room. All over the world. I mean, I was in England for eight months doing a miniseries two or three years ago. And I thought for sure, you know, my, my, like I said, most of my career has been American television. And I was amazed at the recognition that I got in, in Europe. Indian men, oh, you're that funny fellow, I know you. <laughs> you make me laugh. <laughs> I was in Budapest, and I hear these two guys in the corner arguing, and all I hear is, and I'm just gibberish language, I don't speak Hungarian, that's sure, but one guy says to the other, Unfeks, Palatgenfeks, People's Court. <laughs> the other guy goes, Night, night, bitchy, fight, take night court. So I'm not very anonymous, but I try to just be a member of this group. I am just a member of this group. What other people's perceptions and, and, uh, and approaches to me as the actor have no place here, but I know it's impossible to avoid. And that's fine. Just, I'm not going to sign anybody's big book. Um, <laughs> but here's the story. Six months before I got sober, I did a play in Los Angeles, directed by a fellow named Johnny. And Johnny had been sober a little while, had fallen off the wagon while he was directing this play. I, on the other hand, was not sober yet, and there were two scenes in the play that I was not in. And when I'd leave stage, I would run two blocks down to some bar in Venice, throw back a few tequilas, and then run back to the theater for my entrance. Perfectly. Timing was always good. Never late. So we did the play. Johnny and I were very close. The following February, I got sober. The following June, he got sober. So he got sober in June of 82, and I got sober in February of 82. I'd always, you know, really rubbed his nose in it that I was sober four months than he, longer. So over the next 18, 19 years, we were buddies in AA. <clears throat> he was a director, a writer, a musician, very artistic fellow. At some point in, the, in his sobriety, he was one of the co-founders of Cocaine Anonymous. I don't know when that happened, where, where in the 80s that occurred, but at some point, that's what happened. He wrote the, uh, the preamble for, for the whole bloody thing. Directly and indirectly, I would not doubt that he saved thousands of people's lives, particularly cocaine addicts in Hollywood. But, you know, Cocaine Anonymous really, 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 I think, did a, a real big service because of the kinds of people that, you know, cocaine kills you quick, and it was always so great because there were also beautiful women in cocaine because you never give cocaine to an ugly girl, right? So <laughs> all the women in cocaine is anonymous. Great. Anyway, 
<clears throat> Johnny was this mentor. He was this guru. His house was always filled with newcomers, drunks, cocaine addicts, yada, yada, yada. Years and years he did this. When I was in England doing that job I just mentioned earlier, I was supposed to speak at a convention in, uh, in Idaho somewhere, Twin Falls, and I couldn't. So I called Johnny and said, listen, do me a favor and go do this for me. And I said, well, after you're done, my house is 75 miles north. Nobody's going to be there. Go sit by the river, fish, have fun, stay in the house for a while. So he did. He went back to L.A., and I was still in England. Um, he wrote a nice note to us saying how wonderful it was to be at the river, etc. Left my wife, sent my wife some beautiful um, uh, china that his grandmother had had. And I was in England. He was supposed to come visit me in England. And he didn't. And so I came back to America and realized that he and, uh, came back to Idaho, and I realized he hadn't been answering my email. But I knew that was, you know, he'd get into a project or, you know, communication was sometimes sporadic. Then when I got a call from Katie S., and she's never called me in her life. So I knew as soon as I picked up the phone and it was her, I knew what she was going to tell me. I just knew it. That's on Johnny dead in his house. He'd been there for several days. His car was about five or six blocks away from his house. He parked it away from his house so that nobody knew he was home. He wasn't answering his email. He wasn't answering his phone. Finally, his sponsor, Howard, called some guys and said, go check on Johnny. Turns out that, you know, and, and this part gets a little fuzzy, and I make some assumptions here, but I think I know what happened. Maybe I don't, but I think I did. Several months earlier, he started taking pain pills legitimately under a doctor's orders because of a bad back. And he kept taking them, and he kept taking them, and he kept taking them. And at some point, he took them all. Because I know, because I know him so well, and I'm the same way, and I'm afraid that I'm the same way, that if I was sitting in my house after this much sobriety and this much notoriety, fucked up, the idea of walking back in this room and going, guess what? But God damn, we have to have that freedom. You must have that freedom to do that. And I know because of his, because of his position in our organization, perchance given to him, foisted upon him by hungry people, he wasn't able to do that. And so instead of fessing up to it, he offed himself. Nearly 20 years sober. You know, this is not just a, you know, an accidental overdose. The man had planned so that people couldn't find him. And for months after, I was so pissed at him. And I talked about it in meetings, how pissed off I was at him. And I talked to someone once and they said, well, you know what, maybe it was just at that point it was okay with his higher power that he leaves. I wanted to throttle the asshole. And that just made me my lack of spiritual development. But I cannot believe some higher power would rather you dead than sitting here in these rooms helping others and yourself live a moral, just, clean, sober life. So I end there because I want to remind myself that I am a drunk who has 24 hours of sobriety at a time. I love what Joey said last night. I may have 20 years of recovery, but I've got one day of sobriety, just like everybody else in this room. And I love being a member of this organization. And I have been an outsider and a loner all of my life. And I have finally found the other lepers. Thank you for keeping me sober today. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.